Um, uh, we've got quite a number of people have signed up, which is fantastic. Probably over 100 people are coming today, which is really good news. But before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're all um, living and working at the moment. In, here in Lismore, we're in the lands of the Bujibal Waibal people of the Bundjalung Nation, and I want to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging, and also um, acknowledge that this land was never ceded. Can I also, for, just for uh, housekeeping purposes, please everyone remember, keep your microphone muted during the presentation and only turn it on at the end if we're having a discussion and you have a question to ask. I also just want you to all know that the seminar is being uh, videoed and audio recorded. Um, so if you ask questions or interact, you will be recorded. And also just to say that we're going to have question time right at the end. Now I keep, I always forget to do this bit. So paying respects to elders past and present. And so that's just the, uh, Zoom housekeeping rules, there will be time for questions at the end, but in the interim, please use the chat, chat function. I will be monitoring the chat function, and so we'll make sure that at the end we get to your questions. Also, just want to say that our next presentation is by uh, Margaret Ross, and she's going to be talking about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy for people with life-threatening illness, and that's on the 17th of March. So put that in your diary and we will be sending out um, an appointment that you can engage with that. So now I'd really like to um, welcome our two presenters today, Dr. Veronica Matthews and Dr. Joe Longman. They're going to be talking on the topic, there's a reason that Aboriginal people are the oldest surviving culture on this planet. Aboriginal approaches to mitigating and adapting to climate change to reduce health and well-being impacts. And just a little bit of introduction, Veronica Ick is a Pondamooka woman from Stradbroke Island, and she co-leads the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Knowledges theme of the Healthy Environments and Lives Network, which is also known as the the HEAL Network, and she co-leads the Centre for Research Excellence in Strengthening Systems for Indigenous Healthcare Equity, which is also more simply known as CRE Stride. Um, she, her work centres on improving Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander holistic healthcare um, systems, which includes environmental health and improving, and improving quality through systems thinking and community-based participatory research. Jo uh, is a Senior Research Fellow here at the University Centre for Rural Health. For the last four years, she's worked intensively on community recovery after the flood study, um, exploring experiences of flooding and the mental health of the community following catastrophic flooding in northern New South Wales. Come in, Cheryl, just have a seat up there. Um, she's recently led a project funded by New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and Environment and the University of Sydney on the mental health impacts of climate change and developing adaptability and resilience in the rural communities. Um, and she and Veronica were both uh, contributors to the Loicha Institute's discussion paper on climate change and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. And they will be talking about the work they did on that area today. So I will hand over, I think, to Veronica. Yeah, good. Thanks so much, Megan, for the introductions and my thanks as well to everybody for coming along today. It's great to see the, the registration numbers up there. Um, just to mention that, that myself and Joe are presenting on behalf of a, a fantastic deadly team, including uh, Amber Rose Atkinson, Grace Lee and, and Chris Vine, and others within the, the Stride and, and Heal Networks. I'd also like to pay respect to the traditional custodians of the lands on which we live and work, uh, and recognise their continuing unceded connection to land and waters, and particularly pay much gratitude to our elders past and present for their wisdom in guiding us how to care for country and community. 
So as Megan mentioned, this is the, the topic of our discussion today, work that we did with the Lowitcher Institute last year, based on, on two parts, a very rapid scoping review completed in about one month, um, hence the deadly fantastic team we we're working with, as well as a, a roundtable discussion where we, dis, where we um, talk through the results of that, that scoping review. And we had the, the privilege of discussing those findings with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community um, leaders, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people and climate and health advocates. So this paper, as well as the roundtable uh, recommendations were launched at COP26 um, in November last year. COP26, if you know, there was a lot of media around at the time, is the climate change conference uh, that was held in, in Glasgow in, in Scotland. So I'd just like to take this opportunity really, because it has been a privilege to be involved in this project. And I want to thank in particular Lowitja, uh, the National Health Leadership Forum, which is made up of the peak Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health organisations, as well as the Climate and, and Health Alliance uh, for their organisation of, of the paper and the round table and their leadership in getting Australian First Nation um, climate change issues heard on both the national and international stage. And just to add that it's a stunning looking paper and we really have to thank our multi-talented Gumbenge and Yegel local artist and researcher who happens to work here at the UCRH Taylor Lowe. So here's, here's the outline of our, our talk and we'll start by um, looking at the context of First Nations experience with climate change. And this, this quote really sums it up. Climate change has roots in colonialism. It is seen by First Nations people as a, an extension or an intensification of colonial processes that are ongoing and have uh, been undermining Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander basic rights for 230 plus, plus years. We'll delve into this a little bit further, as well as talk through the, the findings of the scoping review, which describe the broad ranging impacts of climate change on our health and wellbeing, um, as well as examples of, of Aboriginal led mitigation and adaptation strategies. And we'll round it out then with what the key recommendations were from the round table and, and future directions. So as Megan said, please, um, we'll have Time for questions at the end, so I encourage you to type away in the chat um, as you as you think of questions as we go through, and we'll pick them up later. So a bit about the science. Um, the Bureau of Meteorology and CSIRO have produced modelling, which you can find at that um, web address there, that predicts the impact of, of climate change. And what it shows is that this impact will vary across Australia, as, as shown in those dot points there. But it also confirms that our communities are at the forefront of climate change and we will be disproportionately impacted. For example, um, the rise in temperature and the increase in, in frequency and intensity of heat waves will happen particularly in the north and in the central regions of, of Australia. And if we focus on these, these heat projections, we can see from the, from the map here that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people make up a, a significant proportion of the population in these areas. So, you know, 18, 17%, 9% in the Western areas of, of Queensland and, and New South Wales. So much, much larger than the 3% of the population that we generally take up um, across, across the nation. So the, the modelling also shows what is likely to happen under various carbon emission scenarios. So if we focus for a moment on predictions for central Australia, which is this line here, as well as the central slope regions, which is the bottom line here, the central slopes take in communities like Romer, St George, uh, Dubbo, Walgett uh, and Maureen. Um, because of the legacy of, of previous greenhouse gas emissions, the earth is already predicted to warm by between one to 
five degrees centigrade by 2030. So that's what these colored dots represent here. Uh, if we take serious action now and work towards net zero by 2050, which is a low emission scenario, we can keep the average warming to that, that particular level. So these are the first open, open dots next to the, um, next to the colored in dots. But if we, under a high emission scenario, which is pretty much business as usual, with no carbon emissions reduction policy, the temperature in these regions will average, um, uh, will average annually, um, sorry, annual average warming in these particular regions will be four degrees centigrade, which is really unimaginable heat. You know, it's likely to render these, these areas uninhabitable. And also under these scenarios, sea level rise will increase between 0 0.5 to, to 1 metres, which will severely impact our co coastal communities, including the Torres, the Torres Strait, low-lying islands of the Torres Strait. So this really just highlights the, the urgency of action now. And this was pretty much highlighted as well during our roundtable discussions. We were lucky enough to have... Um, Norm Japarula at the discussion, and he he's from Tenet Creek, from Waramungu country, and he spoke about witnessing ancient waterholes drying up, enduring these prolonged um, excessive hot days with inadequate housing and energy security. Traditional food sources are already disappearing. We've heard from um, Torres Strait organisations that coast, the coastal in, inundation in Torres is happening already washing away their, their land and, and way of life. We'll show some video clips from both Norman and Yessi a bit later on, um, get, having them explain what the various impacts on their health and wellbeing are. So the resilience of, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities really is incredible in the face of colonisation and this ongoing impact. Country is a fundamental determinant of health. It's our foundation, it's foundational to our identity and, and knowledge systems and cultural practices. And ours has always been a reciprocal relationship. We've always been caretakers of country, maintaining that, that balance, enhancing biodiversity, and in return, country nourishes us in a number of different facets, physically, mentally, spiritually, culturally. Now, colonization has interrupted this connection creating disparities in health and wellbeing through, through dispossession of, of land, suppression of culture and, and disempowerment. Now, climate change is perpetuating these, these pro processes, adding environmental injustice to the range of historical injustices and exacerbating feelings of powerlessness for, for our community. And despite the um, accumulation of knowledge that we have from sustainably adapting and caring for country over millennia, our perspectives haven't really been featured prominently in the Australian national discourse on, on climate change. There is increasing First Nation scholarship, however, um, calling out those structural inequities in, in preventing community uh, from taking control and utilizing their wealth of, of knowledge and actively planning for, for climate adaptation. And as with ecological tipping points, we are nearing a relational tipping point. The Mar Maori scholar Rhys Jones talks about the current clim climate crisis as being an opportunity to really restore um, relationships between non-Indigenous and First Nations people. And listening to our, our mob is a critical step um, to centre our, our knowledges and solutions to climate challenges. As our title says, we are the oldest surviving culture on the planet. So we do know, you know something about changes to country and how we have adapted over millennia. So fundamentally, I think our, our relationship with country needs to change from an extractive take-all approach to one that is more Indigenous, um, culturally relevant, more reciprocal, enhancing health of country and making sure that health of country is prioritised and maintained. And for First Nations Day climate solution, this will require some attention to the power imbalances that exist currently. The discussion paper draws on a number of examples of continuing colonisation, of the inadequacy of, of current policy and, and legislation frameworks to protect our rights to land and its resources and to adequate shelter. And this is evidence um, 
by recent examples of, of native title extinguishment, for example, for the Adani mine, destruction of 40,000 years of culture at Dukan Gorge by, by Rio Tinto, and really decades of ineffective housing policy with continued crowding, inappropriate design and poor maintenance. But thanks to Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander leadership, there are some signs that um, this is changing slightly. So for instance, with the closing the gap, the new indicators around access to land and, and housing. And in the uh, refreshed National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Plan, um, there is a priority now around healthy environments, sustainability and preparedness. So that, that is increased accountability for our governments, which is good to see. Now, First Nations frustration has led though to, to climate litigation, which leads me to this next um, clip from, from Yezi Mosby. He's one of the Torres Strait Eight you probably have, have heard of. Um, they're taking a claim to the United Nations against the Australian government. So I'll just play that short video now from, from Yezi, and then I'll hand over to Joe to talk through the scoping review outcomes. Our fear is getting evacuated off this place, leaving our genealogy behind, our lineage behind, leaving our family remains behind, having our life become a history. My name is Yesem Mosby. I'm from Masig Island in the Kulkalgal Nation, the central part of the Torres Strait, between the tip of Australia and Papua New Guinea. I'll walk out, I'll show you how far, uh, where the island used to be. So this particular area here was in the bush. It all had big trees and everything here, which is all gone now. has been scattered. We are still looking for her. What we found, we tried to save her. These are bones of my grandmother under a little tree. To see that in my lifetime is, is heartbreaking. We, we are witnessing the, the change. that this is a really important and creative effort to better link human rights with the impacts of climate change. It's not always the case that countries follow the Human Rights Committee reports, which are intended as recommendations for countries and are not binding. However, they are persuasive for other courts um, and for other legal bodies. I think factually, the sea level rise in the Torres Strait lends itself to a case such as this in very stark terms. We've been free here for thousands of years. Our fear of getting moved off this home, off our home is scary. We didn't contribute nothing towards the fossil fuel and uh, all the burnings and hustles and bustles was happening around. We, we didn't contribute nothing, but yet we're at the front line and getting the impact of everything. Now uh, it's not right. We're 
were the Human Rights Committee to rule in favour of the Torres Strait Islanders in this case, we would have on the record the very strong recognition of the impact that climate change is having on human rights. This would be a signal to Australia and the rest of the world that in order to comply with our human rights obligations, we do need to mitigate climate change and increase our responses to the urgency of the problem. As we waiting, a home is being eaten away. Something has to be done right now. Don't wait for till the time where we're going to be, you know, moved off and be refugees in our own country. Save it while you can now. Okay, thanks so much, Veronica. All right, so it's my job to say a little bit more um, about the work that we did for the rapid scoping review that um, contributed to the discussion paper for Lowitcher. So um, the rapid scoping review had two key aims. The first was to look at how climate change impacts both directly and indirectly on the health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, and secondly, what the mitigation and or adaptation approaches to climate change that benefit the health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So in the review, we included both academic and grey literature. Um, and the final set of papers that we included were, um, we had 194 papers. Um, and this, uh, this graph here shows you a breakdown of the kind of topics um, that were covered. So in the scoping review, we're looking at mapping these topics across, um, across the grey and, and published literature. So what you can see here is the papers that are on impact, so that's looking at the health impacts of climate change, are across quite a, a, a sort of even spread, if you like, of these kind of topic areas. So the blue here is land and sea management, and the orange is water and drought, and the yellow is, is food, for example. Um, and there were far more papers in the literature around impact, health impacts of climate change than there were around um, mitigation or adaptation. Um, but what you can see quite clearly here is that the mitigation and adaptation literature is much more around land and sea management and water and drought. There's not such a spread across topic areas. Um, and really, that means the main focus on land and sea management is around range of programs, essentially. That's what's in the, in the literature. Um, and as a result, geographically, those, um, those resources are much more focused on remote and very remote areas. So from what we could ascertain from, the, from those 194 papers, around 10 to 15% of papers actually included Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander authorship. Um, and about a quarter of them stated some level of community involvement. So just by doing that kind of map, you can see some really clear gaps there um, in the literature, the need to bring in more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives and to broaden research to cover all community contexts and geographies and climate concerns. So here's a slide about some of the um, direct impacts on health and well-being. This is a summary. Um, extreme temperatures, heat waves, Veronica's talked about that a bit already. Um, but obviously the exacerbation of chronic disease under those circumstances, and also things like a greater risk of um, occupational accidents and injury, particularly for outdoor workers, agricultural workers, or mining uh, workers, um, and increased adverse pregnancy outcomes. Sea level rise, we've just heard about, um, loss of land, loss of home, but also loss of water and food resources, and obviously importantly, loss of cultural sites. Um, drought, again, you've got loss of... Um, resources, food and water resources. You've also got increased dust pollution and again, exacerbation of um, chronic disease. Um, extreme fire weather, bushfires and bushfire smoke, again, exacerbating chronic disease, loss of home, obviously loss of life um, in some circumstances um, and food resources and also contamination of water resources. Um, and for cyclones and floods, you've got death and injury, and again, loss of home and food resources and contamination of water resources. Um, and, and importantly, there's also the issue of seeing the land sick um, and the, the really key social and emotional well-being impacts of, of living in and seeing the land sick <clears throat> in that kind of way, excuse me. <clears throat> okay, so on to... 
some more indirect impacts. This is a listing of indirect impacts that are around altered natural systems. So there's impacts around food security. Um, so communities becoming more reliant on store food that can be poor quality, as well as unreliable and expensive in rural and remote areas due to transportation and storage costs. Um, and impacts on bush food availability, um, local horticultural crops and seafood. Water security, um, you've got a shortage of safe drinking water, but also a shortage of water for sanitation. Um, when you've got something like salt water intrusion, um, that leads to an increase in infectious disease, as well as, as, as I said, less water available for sanitation. Um, and in terms of infectious disease, uh, changing habitat of disease vectors um, and also increased food, water and soil borne disease. And then here's a list of the indirect impacts on health and well-being from altered social systems. So you've got housing and infrastructure. Veronica mentioned housing um, briefly at the beginning. We're going to come back to housing a bit. But obviously, you've got inadequate design. You've got energy poverty. Um, there are issues around um, housing really not offering a, adequate shelter. So either from cyclones or from, from heat in particular. Um, so here's a, here's a quote again from actually Uncle Norm, who Veronica mentioned earlier from the Alice Springs News, saying housing uses too much energy of the wrong kind to keep it bearably cool in the summer and to warm it in the winter. We should use the sun for our energy. Um, there's also intangible loss, so connection to country and culture. So where you've got extreme weather, that can compromise a community's ability to carry out its cultural responsibilities in caring for country, and also further compound those ecological um, degradation issues, um, as well as having a negative impact on uh, social and emotional well-being. Um, and forced relocation from rising seas, we heard that um, on, the, on the video there, um, really just how incredibly scary that is as a thought to be re relocated and, and how powerful that is in terms of impacting on people's mental health and well-being um, of, of facing relocation. Um, and we've got a, a point here about health services too. So in relation to health systems, climate change can impact service operations in extreme weather situations where people are flooded out or there's massive disruption because of an extreme weather event. There may be increased demand um, and also reduced workforce capacity. So here we're citing a paper from last year, um, which was uh, a paper looking at uh, health professionals in the Northern Territory, 85% of whom uh, reported witnessing adverse health impacts and around a third of them indicating that they would consider leaving due to extreme weather. Um, so obviously climate change magnifying significant workforce uh, pressures and, and they're already considerable pressures in, um, in some of those uh, health services. So this slide really is just to, to pull together and make the point around complexity of these relationships. So there's a, a series of very complex pathways by which people's health is impacted by climate change. So this is from, uh, this is a causal process diagram from a paper um, from Helen Berry and colleagues. Um, and it doesn't matter that you can't see the detail of this, um, but essentially it's, it's an illustration of just the complexity of those interwoven pathways. So in summary about health impacts um, from the literature, there are, a, a, a large number of impacts, both direct and indirect, they are complex um, and they disproportionately impact on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's health and well-being. So there's an exacerbation here of existing inequity um, and a really pressing need to address inequity and power imbalances. But also, as Veronica mentioned, there's a, a possibility here of opportunity to reset some relationship and work with community and value indigenous knowledges and provide equitable access to land and other resources. So I'm just going to go on now and talk briefly about um, mitigation and adaptation and what we found um, from our scoping review around that. And there are a, a few key concepts. I'm not going to spend much time on here. I'm just going to give you some idea of what we mean by these things. So in terms of mitigation, we're talking about actions that reduce the amount of atmospheric carbon dioxide. 
By adaptation, we're looking at mechanisms that can help communities to adjust and cope with the impacts of climate change. And by adaptive capacity, we're talking about the ability to undertake adaptation. So I'm going to move on now to, um, to talk um, about Uncle Norm in a bit more detail. So Uncle Norm's story is about solar panel installation. So Uncle Norm is a incredible trailblazer who has extraordinary tenacity. He's a community leader from uh, Tennant Creek. And it's important to note that temperatures in Tennant Creek can get over 40 degrees um, in a 12 month period, around 50 days are more than 40 degrees. And temperatures like that are dangerous for anyone um, because proteins in the body literally start to cook apparently at those heats. Um, and anyone who is unable to take shelter from that heat, possibly because they've lost power at home, um, are gonna be in serious trouble in terms of their health. So um, Uncle Norm lives in public housing. Around um, 10,000 mostly Indigenous people are living in um, public housing in the Territory. Um, and most of those people rely entirely on a prepaid meter for their power, as does Uncle Norm or did Uncle Norm. Um, so Uncle Norm has young grandchildren and um, he is also living with diabetes and needs to keep his uh, medication refrigerated. And as I said, he's on a prepaid power card. And some research that Uncle Norm was involved in um, with colleagues from ANU, um, they found that 90% of public housing uh, residents actually ran out of credit at least once a year. And Uncle Norm has this phrase about shaking the bush. If you don't shake the bush, no one's going to listen to you. And he has been doing that for many years, actually working, trying to work with the Northern Territory government to get permission to install solar panels on his roof and then to get them switched on so that he could actually use the electricity um, from those solar panels. So access to energy security is a key issue in communities like these. We're just going to play a video now of Uncle Norm so that you can get... If I have no power, it's no good for me. How can I put my insulin and all my medication away, you know, or keep it cool, and plus cooking? The sun will be there for a lifetime. It's not going to run away. It's not going to go. We are working with Jakarta Energy around the tariff systems because this is new territory, um, but we're absolutely committed to finding a solution. Extreme heat that disrupts the power supply for even a couple of hours can destroy their medications and destroy the contents of their food and is immediately life-threatening. It's a very significant and very overlooked issue. be like a spotlight here at Mullinger for other, other health station, living area, other community can, can do it too, you know. It's good for the environment and good for the climate, it's good for, good for country and good for, I think good for people health, you know and I think the future need, need it, you know? Because I think we should all have solar systems like that in our communities. If I have no power, it's no... Okay, so thanks for, thanks for that, Uncle Norm. Um, 
So the good news is that he's had a win and um, he has now, as far as we understand it, got permission to actually use the energy that he is producing from the solar panels on his roof to keep his home cool and his medications refrigerated and to cook. Um, so in a way, his, his case study is good in terms of these are some of the direct impacts and indirect impacts um, of extreme heat, um, but also of, of actually providing some uh, mitigating uh, actions by, by using uh, power that's generated by renewables rather than um, fossil fuel. Um, and Veronica has already talked about um, the uh, Torres Strait 8 as another example, really good example of, um, of mitigation action. So um, we're going to talk just about two more case studies that we found in the literature. There are others. So as I said at the beginning of, of my talk here, the majority of mitigation examples in the literature really focus on ranger programs. Um, so land and sea management, including the use of cultural fire practices for carbon abatement. So abatement programs reduce the amount of CO2 that are produced through land management practices. So for example, strategic fire management can prevent large and intense bushfires um, that emit loads of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So the Arnhem Land Fire uh, Abatement Program is an example of that. So this is a long-term collaboration of community-based ranger groups and they have formed an Aboriginal owned not-for-profit company to use fire management for carbon abatement across about 80,000 kilometers um, of savannah country in Arnhem Land. So the rangers patch burn uh, the landscape during early and mid dry season while the conditions are cooler and that can prevent uncontrolled wildfires that are then going to emit loads of um, greenhouse gases. And the company that they form generates carbon credits for sale under contract to um, private corporations or to the Australian government, and that provides an income then um, for the traditional owner communities that are located in those abatement areas. So um, there are many co-benefits, health benefits, um, including from these kind of programs. Um, so here we can see they're, bu they're building on the positive relationships between caring for country and health. Um, they're improving social, economic and cultural determinants of health. And they provide a platform for greater appreciation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledges, which is so important. Um, what they do show is um, a recognised need for um, data indicators that are more health oriented. So at the moment, most of the evaluation of these kind of programmes looks at um, environmental benefits, economic benefits and cultural benefits. There are less indicators around health, so we could, we could use a few more of those. Um, so the second case study I want to talk about is the Arabana um, Adaptation Strategy case study. So um, the Arabana people are the traditional owners of um, Lake Eyre in South Australia. Um, and they led a participatory process of adaptation planning, highlighting specific areas of local climate concern. And the Arabana community have developed a set of criteria for effective adaptation. So, that includes building adaptive capacity by using a bottom-up approach, a place-based approach, a holistic approach, and by utilizing local knowledges. Um, and one of the issues raised from this kind of case study is that um, the sustainability of funding, this kind of uh, current stop-start nature of initiatives really don't allow for um, ongoing implementation or um, for evaluation. So what these case studies can show is that um, climate change does present an opportunity for some redress um, and um, some maybe empowerment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities to lead climate action and climate planning um, on, based on their intimate uh, traditional and historical knowledges of country. So just a final slide about um, opportunity, I guess, for health services. We know there's a few um, health service people who have joined us today. Um, so we wanted to just highlight that this is really an opportunity for health services to take leadership in understanding climate change impacts on health, advocating for an appropriately resourced national plan, possibly along the, the lines of um, the Climate and Health Alliance, their healthy, regenerative and, and just framework. 
um, to, to help support some of those necessary adaptations with community as well as mitigating their own carbon footprint. So here's some of the actions, advocacy, adaptation planning and implementation, reducing their own carbon footprint, and also incorporating connection to country activities in terms of the health benefits that can flow on from that in the community. Okay, so I'm gonna hand back over to Veronica now um, to talk in a bit more detail about the roundtable recommendations. Thanks, Joe. Um, there were four main calls resulting from the discussion about the scoping review from the roundtable. Um, so they're listed there. The first one being take action. And um, I'm amazed at, at Uncle Norm's story. I mean, it, it's all about shaking the bush, but just to think how the, the amount of hurdles that he had to jump through compared to you know, um, households in urban centers and how easy it is to uh, attach solar and, and get, it get it powered into your home. It just shows the inequity and in access to resources very clearly. And I just, I just want to acknowledge uh, Original Power and the First Nations Energy Network for their role in helping Uncle Norm in Turnit Creek. It's one household and there's a lot more to, to go. So um, hopefully, they can keep the momentum up. But Take Action is really about urging our governmental leadership. Um, we need to seriously, uh, or take serious measures to immediately reduce emissions and avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Then listen to us. So value and center our knowledges and rights as first peoples. We are intimately connected to country. You saw the distress in Yezi's face when he was speaking about the loss of his country. Um, and we do, our knowledges and cultural practices really do hold potential solutions to, to climate crises. Then work with us. We need equitable access to resources, as I just mentioned, to facilitate participation and adaptation. We need adequate housing, appropriate housing, renewable energy solutions and access to our lands and waters to help us protect the country. And all of this leads to climate justice. Uh, as Joe and, and I have mentioned previously, it really is an opportunity to restore relationships in this country. And we need to ensure that climate action or inaction um, learns from the past and doesn't perpetuate the existing inequities that we're experiencing currently. So just, just a final slide as well to talk about a, um, I think, a, you know, it's an exciting new project that, that is starting up this, this year called Healing Country that I feel addresses, you know, those, those main recommendations that have come from the roundtable, um, as well as the gaps highlighted by the, the scoping review about the need to bring in more First Nations perspectives and broaden the research to cover different community contexts. So we're very lucky to receive uh, some funding where we'll be working with three Aboriginal communities in, in different um, geographical contexts, bringing, bringing their knowledges to the fore for, for climate action. So essentially, we will be um, utilising participatory approaches and Indigenous research methodologies to build, to build these community story data maps, laying local community stories with relevant environmental and, and health data to highlight what the local priority climate change impacts on, on health and wellbeing are. Local Aboriginal community map makers will be employed across the four years of, of the project period to, to work with uh, cultural and uh, cultural experts and knowledge holders to collate the community stories, their experiences of environmental changes that have and are occurring, and the impact that this has had on, on their um, community well-being. As I mentioned, these community stories will then be supplemented by environmental and health data to give a complete picture, um, modeling future changes. Uh, so giving a complete picture of what will likely occur as a result of climate change. These, these story data maps will be digital and interactive, um, made available online pending community permissions 
So there will be strict Indigenous cultural property protocols around this, around this project, as well as Indigenous data sovereignty principles. Um, we, we hope that these community story data maps will become important advocacy tools for, for local community and will form the foundation then um, of climate action plans that can be co-designed with community and local uh, relevant stakeholders. Some of those strategies that come out from those plans, we hope to then trial through, through the four-year project. So I, I, I think what, what is so exciting about this project is that it does centre First Peoples' knowledges. It will be led by Aboriginal communities, build local um, or strengthen local capability in, in mapping and, and data techniques. Um, and a priority for the project is the sustainability of this, of this work. So we want these story data maps to be accessible to community, for them to be housed in local organisations and built upon by community to continue telling their story into the future and can be used then as a platform for, for continued climate action. Um, as with a lot of research projects, though, um, we have delayed the start of this start of this work due to, due to COVID. Uh, we do have one of the communities in the NT um, very much thick in, in um, the outbreak of, of COVID there. So we're hoping to be able to start the project in, in July this year. Uh, and we will, yeah, present in future the outcomes of this work. So looking forward to that. And that, that's the end. Um, so thank you very much again for coming along today and joining us in, in this. Yes, we'll open it up to questions now. And Megan is convening that discussion. So hand it over to you, Megan. Thanks, John Veronica. That's um, inspiring, disturbing. Um, yeah, but a really great presentation. So thank you for that. I have been monitoring the chat and there have not been any specific questions. So there is a link provided to the CAHA framework um, by Remy Shergill. So that's great. That's there in the chat for those who want it. But I would like to now open it up for questions. I've got my laptop here so I can see you, which we can't, we, it's one of the interesting things about presenting here from our lecture theatre is we can't see the normal things you can see with Zoom. Um, so I've got my laptop on the side, which is why I'm moving a bit sideways. But if people would like to speak, we would now like to open it up for questions. Um, and I'm just seeing what's coming up. There are now a couple of, lots of thank yous, great presentations. But is there anyone you can, if you would like to speak or ask a question, please just take yourself off mute and do so. Lots of thank yous. <laughs> We've still got about 50 people online, so uh, there may be some questions, but so far. Not. Ah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Cheryl. I'm so focused on everyone else. Um, Cheryl, yes, you have a question. Uh, no. I'll just repeat the question. Yeah. It's going to be the easiest. So, Shall I repeat the question or did you? So the question was from um, Professor Cheryl Jones, who's the Dean of the Sydney Medical School. And it was about how do we, given that we've got a, 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 a an election, a, a federal election coming up, how do we raise this issue within that context and get attention to it with, with politically for the federal election, make it front and centre? There's a challenge. <laughs> Yeah, fantastic question, Cheryl. And um, 
I, I think it, it, it sort of is happening, you know, with, with Simon Home Support and his support for independence coming up to the, the federal election. But it, but it is interesting, isn't it? So when the COP26 was around in November last year, there was so much attention on climate change and the inadequate response, really, from our federal government. Um, and that has sort of dissipated. It's, it's, it's gone off the, the mainstream media focus. So there is a role, I think, for people like us um, to continue that conversation. We can do it through any platforms that we can, we can access, such as seminars like this. But also there are organisations out there like the Climate and Health Alliance doing fantastic work in this space, as well as the Literature Institute. Um, we, we don't know when the, when the federal election will be, sometime in the first half of this year. So, yeah, I, th I think there does need to be some focused effort once it is called to really um, make climate change one of the key issues, but also First Nations, the consequences for First Nations people part of that advocacy. Do you want to I didn't quite need to add to that. They are key leaders about key just keeping, keeping talking about it as much as we possibly can. Um, I don't know if anybody's got any, any additional ideas from the audience or from online about what we could or might be, might be doing. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. And Yes. Government's very, very good at um, rabbit holing. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that grassroots action really does lead to change as well. I mean, if there's a, a total lack of action from our political leaders, but things can happen from the ground up. And that's what Healing Country is about. And if we can influence the system that way, I think that's a, a good thing too. I think I'm a bit late. <laughs> Thank you. I also think there is something really important about positive stories. Um, so, Absolutely. I think, you know, acknowledging impacts and, and sort of uh, making sure that that's understood and that it's happening now. Yes. And it's happening, with, you know, here in this country. It's not something that's elsewhere. And there's other attention that's like elsewhere, you know, look over there, look over there, sort of thing. Whereas actually it's happening here. But I think the positive messages too. That what's currently there are things we can do being done that people are doing. you know if we have the conversations so there is a question in here about what can we all do this is from the audience i guess we are all wondering what we can do to help or support your work um and i think it is around this advocacy things but are there any things specific um you know tweeting message uh, uh, you know, you know we've, yeah. we've got to get this out it's all very well to do a nice little seminar and it's great i mean it was really good thank you um but also it, it, you know we've, we've had a good audience there were about 50 or so people who, who were online during the presentation but we need to be reaching beyond those 50 and finding ways to to get that message out so are there things that we could put up that you could put up on the heal website or the stride website or the CRH website that people can then link to and using social media, which as we all know, I'm an absolute expert on. Um, and, and you know, just start thinking about their targeting politicians, targeting groups who are 
activist groups and advocacy groups and not just get up and others. Are there things we can put up somewhere? Well, it's already there on the Lowich website. It's, it's the paper mm -hmm. itself. I'd, I'd be encouraging people to, to share that widely and to start having those, those conversations. Shaking the bush is, is what Norm would suggest. Um, you know, writing to your politicians. Every, well, yeah, all of that type of advocacy work, I think. Um, yeah, add it up together if everybody does their own little bit, or, you know, um, form a bit of a tsunami, but it's probably not the, <laughs> the best analogy. But um, yeah, yeah, we've just got to pepper, pepper our politicians. So the, the report is up on the Luitra website um, and it would be important for people to go look at that and then tweet about it and start using advocacy. So, um, so yeah, so yeah. Still I don't think it was working before, but I'll give it another go. So I was going to say even to have, oh, it's working now, on the website, just a couple of ideas for people. You know, what are some things, so, you know, write to your local MP, you know, so giving a few, you know, tweet about the report. So just giving people perhaps some actions might be something because yeah. people are really keen to do things. Can I make a comment? Yes, please. It's Emma. Hello. Sorry, I had my hand up. I just wasn't sure if you could see it. Um, I, I, sorry, I just wanted to say, I suppose the things I, I think about when I'm listening to today is the fact that it's it's like health issues. It's the thing about these these amazing things are available. There are very simple ways of, of making big impacts on, on the environment right now, and they're all available. They're not, they're not you know, an alternate universe to have them. It's rights to access, that's the issue. It's that, that people aren't allowed to have them or not allowed to use them. And that I think is where we need to be thinking about pushing government and local, um, you know, local councils and those sorts of places. And, and an example is, you know, we have the knowledge to do um, cultural burns in this region in the Northern Rivers, but we're not allowed to do it. And that's really frustrating because it's actually better for the environment and stops um, fires when they come around. Um, that we're not allowed to do it. So I suppose from my perspective, it's about, you know, rights and, uh, you know, human rights and being allowed to be able to do the things that, that keep us safe naturally that would be better for the environment. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Anna. Any more questions from Ru? Amal, you wanted to, to speak. But you just see if you can make it turn on. You've got to hold it down. Oh, uh, yes, it's working now. Yeah, no, no thank you, uh, uh, Veronica and Joe. It's really a great presentation and fantastic work, very important part. Uh, just a little comment because um, there are people out there like who think so uh, climate change is not my problem because I'm not feeling it because I've got cooling and heating uh, properly done at my home, so I don't care. But this is going to bite everyone. So I think targeting though everyone uh, with, with this advocacy is really important. Like this is going to bite everyone. So it's time to uh, take that action uh, now then later so they can, uh, so uh, people can start moving <laughs> and shaking the bush and contacting their local uh, politicians to take, uh, make things happen. And I had a, one uh, little question about that healing country, like what kind of environmental and health data that you are talking about here? Thank you. Uh, that really depends, Amal, on what the community priorities are for, for those regions. So um, it, there'll be things like temperature and rainfall and you know, the typical environmental data that we, that we do have access to. Um, but again, it's, it's going to depend on the community location, what they're experiencing and what they want to essentially display on their community story data. And we have um, great data scientists on, on the team, Terry Mengerson at QUT, our own Jeff Morgan and um, Ivan Hannigan from, from Curtin, who are very skilled in developing up data platforms for this, for this purpose. 
So a uh, very, very much a multidisciplinary team. Um, what, yeah, so what, what the, the data layers will look like uh, is, is yet to come, essentially. But yes, good point too about you know about people not not feeling not feeling it. But I, I noticed over summer, you know, in, in Melbourne during the Australian Open, you know, there was there was news stories about um, uh, renters, you know, in, in these little hot boxes in Melbourne that just couldn't couldn't withstand the forty degree heat that was happening. So uh, you know, it's starting to happen in open locations too. And uh, for sorry, obviously for the for the tenants, but it's you know it's it's shining a, a a picture of shining more of a light, I suppose, on, on what um, on what the issues are, particularly the current issues around climate change. So that's you know, it's not just a, a remote Aboriginal community, it's urban communities too. Yes, it's very much everyone's problem and uh, important that we get everyone taking responsibility. So look, thank you both. That's fantastic, really important and um, very, disturbing but also the positive stories in there I think are going to be valuable um, in like you say shining the light and getting action because it's not all hopeless there are actually opportunities here that we can take so thanks everyone for coming uh, just another reminder that on the 17th of March we have our next presentation which is about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy for people with life threatening illnesses. So that should be very interesting. Um, and thanks again for coming. Stop share. Thank you.